Hello, my name is Kirsty and I'm one of the librarians at Wyndham City Libraries. I'd like to thank you all for joining us this evening and we're just going to start with an acknowledgement of country. Wyndham City Council recognises Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the first custodians of the lands on which Australia was founded. Council acknowledges the Wathaurong, Wairarong and Boonarong peoples of the Kulin Nation as the traditional owners of the lands on which Wyndham is being built. Council re pays respects to the wisdom and diversity of past and present elders. We share commitment to the nurturing of future generations of elders in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. It gives me great pleasure this evening to introduce our guests, interviewer and man about the locked downtown, Bruno Lettieri, and wow. best-selling author and teacher Rosalie Ham. So I'll hand it over to you. Rosalie, buonasera, good evening, slamat malam. How are you? I'm well, thank you. I am Where well. Are, I can't where speak are you? any other languages, sorry, so I'll just have to say good evening. Well, you toured South America on a motorcycle, I'm, I'm told, but we, we'll talk about that later. But where are you exactly? What what suburb are you in? What, what um, room are you in? I'm in beautiful downtown, oh, actually not downtown, but I'm in beautiful Brunswick. Yeah. Uh, not far from the zoo uh, or the golf course. And is this your special writing room that we, we can see behind you? Or? No, it's the only room in the house where there wasn't other people on device <laughs> watching television. So it's the spare room, and I apologise oh. for doing I thought, something interesting I, to look at. I thought we were going to be in your studio, and I was going to say, show us your studio. The, oh, here's the writer in her natural habitat. You, oh, my gosh. If I no, know, that's Okay. No, no, I, I understand. I'm in Clifton Hill. I could almost open my balcony, Rosalie, and, right. and bellow. Wouldn't that be great? Oh, with Clifton Hills that way, yeah. <laughs> don't, don't ask me. <laughs> tell me, tell me, um, are writers, and you're probably going to say, well, writers are a very diverse bunch, but are writers more temperamentally suited to this, this crazy period of lockdown, are writers able to sometimes somehow go, I'm used to going within, I'm used to being in solitude, I'm used to being my little tower, this doesn't disturb me too badly? That's that's completely accurate. Um, but I'm we're, we're a little bit cautious. It was a secret up until you've just mentioned it, but there's a few writers I know and we're all kind of looking at each other going, you know, like, what a wonderful thing. Even um, bookshop owners, people who own bookshops, I've walked in to p collect books and they're, they're saying, aren't we having a lovely time? And I've said, yes, we are. But um, we're still very much aware that the rest of the world's having a terrible time. But for us, Absolutely. it's a bit of a gift, I have to say. You're, wait, you're waiting for your new book to come, The Writer's, you know, The Dressmaker's Secret, not The Writer's Secret. Is that a, is that a time of great kind of anxiety? Is it a time of, of great relief? Is it a time of going, I can just now wait for it to come? Other people who are fashioning the book who have to publicise it, it's now over to them, but I've done my bit. Mm. Um, all of the above. It's a little bit nerve wracking. There was an article in the paper the other day and it was talking about the fact that um, this year, 20%, there's a 20% increase in the amount of books that are being published in the four weeks before Christmas. Um, during that period, there's that's when all the sales happen. And so I was, you know, I, I felt quite, quite content up until that point. And then I went, ooh, I've got an extra 20% of people to cope with. But but those things are momentary. The, 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 the sense for me is... Um, one of relief and I'm really happy that I've finally got the book out there. Um, so I swing between being anxious about it um, and being elated that it's not there. And in the meantime, I've cleaned the shed and I'm just about to turn my attention to the attic. Every drawer and cupboard in my house is completely organised and I'm sure I'm not the only person that's doing that at this time. 
Helen Garner tells me that she just goes demented when she has just finished a book and sometimes she's spent seven years on it. Mm. And the first question people ask her is, are you working on another one? And she says, no, I just want to go and lie down and not move for a year. Mm. Do you feel a bit like that after you've completed a, a work? Did you feel something has been sort of taken out of you and you you really do just need to recover and rest and and not not write a line at all? For this one, yes, I do feel that because... Um, uh, there was a bit of a rush to get it all done on time over the last year. So I've been working fairly solidly, so I haven't really thought about anything else. But normally, by the time I start talking about my book, it's already been completed a year yeah. and it's been waiting its turn. And so I've usually, you know, creativity has kind of dropped into my mind and I've, I've often got another idea. But now I have no idea. I'm panicking a little bit, hence the cleaning of the shed rest of it. The other, the other sense I get from Sophie Laguna is, is when I've met her and, and I'm excited about the book and I'm going, and, you know, and, of course, she's already gone, but I've moved on already in some sense too. Uh, and she's not being disrespectful to the excitement of the audience is because we're just meeting it and we're just coming into that world that she's just created for us. So there's that bit of it, that disconnect, I suspect. Is that true? Absolutely. That's been the case in the, the, my previous four novels that I've completed, there's been that gap of a year before I have to start talking about it again, and I have actually moved on. But it, there's this lovely thing, and I did it just this afternoon. I suddenly thought, oh, my gosh, I've got to talk to Bruno and the world tonight about this. <laughs> I wonder what it's actually about. What did I write? What am I going to say? How am I going to explain it? So I went back and I revisited a few few pages of it and read it through, and I and I thought... Actually, this is not too bad. This will be that right. Fine. Yeah, well, that was only those pages. If I'd sure. read on, I might have, might have started doubting. So I read a few pages. So I'm kind of a little bit back with the story now. And I also just got the proof just this week. And so and that's what I've been reading. And that's not how the book wow. works, but I've got the, the proof cover of it. Wow. So it's a solid, like it's a thing now, and I'm I'm feeling quite smug. There's the physicality of the book, the arrival of the book, and it's got your name. And, and I don't see you as being a person full of hubris and arrogance at all, Rosalie, from the few no. times we've met. But but there must be a, a childlike excitement of going, this is something I've crafted. Obviously, it's an ensemble performance because others mm. have also, you know, been part of it too. Is, is that joy still there? As my glasses fall apart. <laughs> yes, yeah, glasses fall apart. It is. Like there's nothing um, better than seeing that. And I'm quite impressed because it's actually quite fat. And I didn't think it was going to be that fat. So uh, I, 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 it arrived in the post and I looked at it and I went, oh, how, mar how marvellous and got on with it. And today when I went back to it and picked it up, I just went, oh, my gosh, how fantastic is that? Look at that. That's amazing. And I'm, I'm feeling, as I say, I'm feeling quite smug at this precise moment now that you mention it. We don't get too used to that feeling. It's not like going, well, I've done this before and this is a bit ho-hum, you know. If it happened every week, we would, but given it only happens every four or five years, um, we're allowed to allow ourselves a little bit of joy because you do, like you... You, you you so often finished the book or the play or the film or whatever it is that you the painting whatever you're working on you kind of go all right now I'm finished now and you go away and do something else for a month and then you come back and and um face the piece of art again and think this is not what I meant this is not actually what I wanted to say or this is not right or I've done it wrong or whatever so then you you start again so each draft there's an end and you think oh well I finished now and you say to people oh I finished and then but you haven't you've still got four or five more drafts to go of the whole thing so it's a bit of that that goes on. Once it's out in the world Rosemary it's kind of out isn't it and irrespective of whether you go back and you go there are bits there that I would love to kind of refashion or bits that I'd love to do again that's not possible hey is it is it difficult to release the thing into the world, knowing that it might have perfect imperfections in your mind and 
and and and are you better at being at peace with that and going there's not a lot i can do about that um again it depends on your mood and occasionally when you do have to pick up a book that you wrote 10 years ago um because someone's asked a question or you've got to talk to somebody about it and you read it and you think that could have been much better you know i've yep. i've ruined that i could have done that much better and so you live with this whole thing of it could have been better and if you yep. just let me have my time again i will change that and sure. make it better because that's the whole object is to it to, to my mind anyway when you write something you write it and then you um go back to it and make it better and you can do that endlessly i could do that with all of my books until i'm um, 98 but you, but you can't you've just got to let it go and the other thing is that you can spend a lot of time on your story and say exactly what you want to say and it goes out there and people will read something else entirely entirely different which is always lovely it's a nice surprise there's the idea of accompanying your book out into the world and having to speak to it is that something that you go it should just be now between the the reader and the book and it shouldn't need my kind of commentary and it shouldn't need my explanation but but we understand the role that you have to play in terms of keeping that kind of alive in the public imagination too do you feel ambivalent about that role or do you go no this is just another part of it and i can enjoy that for what it is and and meeting my readership and and seeing how they've reacted to my book look for me i don't know if this is true of, of all writers but for me the opportunity to talk about something yeah. that's taken five yeah. years to write is a wonderful thing um so when people ask me or when I go and do library talks or school talks and people discuss things with me, particularly if they bring up things that I didn't notice, um, I'm thrilled to bits. And there's a lot of writers. I'm so fortunate because the dressmaker was, is on the English list and it's on the VCE lit list now. And so I get asked a lot of questions about it. And that, to me, is very fortunate. But a lot of books go out into the world and they're brilliant books and they're great books and thousands of people read them, if not more or four people read them either way the author isn't asked to speak about it and i sometimes feel that that's kind of not kind of not fair you know because it's something it's a it's a, a creative wonderful thing that you've spent years doing and um you know you want some sort of acknowledgement for it and so i'm very fortunate that i do get that acknowledgement but there's a lot of writers that don't you know, i feel sorry for people that write films and, and plays and do paintings and all those sorts of things and nobody sees them. Is so, writing more of an ensemble performance than we give it credit for? Because you mentioned film, of course, in film the credits go up and the credits yeah. last for minutes, don't they? I'm thinking about you and your editors. I'm thinking about you and your publishers and the way they are able to maybe zoom in on something and go, this isn't working yeah. or... Or this, or you need to cut lots of this, and all that. They're all creative involvements as in, as well, aren't they, Rose? Uh, Rosalie. They are. They are. And the, a good editor will make your book better, and they do. And they slice things out, and it hurts a little bit. But it, but the reason I used to write um, plays many years ago, and I I wasn't comfortable with the collaboration all that much. I felt. I, I used to keep having to make far too many compromises along the way and I personally wasn't comfortable with that. I probably would be now because I know that it is an ensemble cast that requires yeah. getting a good piece of work out yeah. there. Um, but one of the reasons I turned to writing novels was because I wasn't at that point in my life accustomed yeah. to people contributing and I wasn't comfortable with it but as I say now I am and I'm grateful because the editors um like when I said the manuscript to this one off the dressmaker's secret they wrote back and said this is fine we'd like to publish it that's okay and and then I went oh good knowing full well that I was going to have to cut probably 10, 20,000 words, possibly shift things around. Um, uh, and I was prepared for that 
now and and grateful because they do they make it better they make it tighter and they pick up all the mistakes and when you're blabbing on for too long and they it's not necessary cut it for the rest of the story Rosalie I, I felt really um naughty about this interview in some ways in that one um I felt that you know it was your first and and the book hasn't even come out and it's not you out for a while and you had to almost smuggle me, you know, a kind of a draft of, of the first two chapters. And, and we're kind of working off that. And part of me felt like saying, Rosalie, I've just photocopied 100,000 and sent it out. And I'm going to totally kind of bring your book. I haven't done that at all. No. Tell, tell me about the firstness of it, the fact that this is your first time talking about it. And as yet, we haven't really gone through all the protocols normally we would have gone through. The book would be ready. I would have read it all. But we, we have to work off me having only read snippets of it. Yes. Is that is that a little, does that make this whole exchange, this conversation between, between us a little bit strange? Or do you go, what the heck, let's just kind of do it and see where it goes? Yeah, no, I'm, oh, what the heck, let's just see it and see where it goes thing. But I, because the, of the nature of the book and because of the content of the story, um, I'm a bit loath to put it out there t too soon. So I, I only sent you a couple of chapters because the third chapter is where you find out what the secret is. Okay. Make a secret. So because Tilly Dunne just got secrets from her past that she's hiding from her present and her future. And she's got secrets from her present that she's hiding from her past, the people of Dungatar. So you've got to find out what those secrets are. And I, I, I have to, I've steeled myself to be able to say now, if I ever get to do any more um, author events, I have to say to people, if you know what happens, can you not ask me yeah. about it in front of 400 people who haven't read no. it yet? So I have to, it's kind of a bit like that. But yeah. I like that. In fact, I like that. In fact, when I've interviewed you before, I, I've, I've not actually read the last third of your book deliberately, you know, and I've done that as a kind of rule. Here I don't know 90% of your book, which I thought, I thought it might add to a certain crypticness and a little bit of kind of secrecy that we could share with the audience, which is kind of a theme of, yeah. of your book as well. So I thought that we could play very naughtily, you know. So you're going to remember this interview in years to come. You're going to go, well, there's only two, two chapters out and it was the first of. Yeah. The first of things, is that still an important aspect of your life? Do you still thrill to the first time doing this or reading that or oh, experiencing yeah. this? Are you still up for the first time kind of events? Well, absolutely, because by the time you get to my age... You're you not going to tell us how old you are, of course. <laughs> but but you've, I've done a lot of things and, like, you know, so the first time for things is um, quite a special thing. Are they going to... Are they going to work, your glasses? That's okay. Yeah, forget that. We're doing okay. Yeah. No, I'm I'm perfectly happy to do the first time of anything. I think it's that's the way to progress and grow and live and move through life. New Rosalie, challenges, new yeah. things. Hmm. Yevtushenko, one of my favourite poets, um, says in one of his poems, he says, when, when a person dies, a whole world dies, and he goes, their first kiss, their first snow, their first experience of snow. I've, I've always loved that immensely. So I, I, got, I got out a, a really big thrill out of getting your manuscript. Hmm. Rosalie, was this book kind of always going to be or was it something that your, your publishers have gone there is such momentum in the book and the film, The Dressmaker, that we can still kind of get, a, we've still got a, a, a massive audience for this? Or, or, or did you always write the first one going, there's going to be another book? No, not at all. In fact, it wasn't until I started um, doing talks in schools when The Dressmaker was on the literature list and uh, one, of the, one of the tasks that the kids had to do was they had to write a um, brand new scene that spoke of scenes that already existed in the book but weren't in the book. And and so I would hear some of these. Really? Wow. Yeah. The kids would read them out to me and, and, you know, and they had some fantastic ideas. Really? 
But then what they would also say was, we think we know where Tilly went. We think we know where she is now. And they had all these endings that they created for Tilly Dunnage. And for a long, long time, I didn't want to mess with that. I thought, well, I'll yeah. just leave yeah. that. But but then equally, there was a whole lot of people saying, will there be a sequel? Can you tell us what happens next? Is she all right? Does she find love again? All that kind of stuff. And so I, and it's been 20 years almost exactly um, we forget that, don't we? Yeah, the, yeah the, the, the dressmaker came out. So probably about, I don't know, 12 years ago, I started just making notes okay. um, and then it became a, a, a bit of an obsession. And so whenever I could, I would write a little bit here and there. And whenever your head isn't bothered by anything else, you're on a long car journey or bored to tears somewhere, you know, it's like the creative muse just drops in and things that have been sitting at the back somehow inveigle their way to the front and new thoughts come. So those sorts of things started happening and they would kind of mushroom for a while and then they would subside and I'd get on with something else and all that kind of stuff. So eventually um, I just thought, all right, I will write this book now because I figured out what's going to happen and I'm going to do it but the, the problem with the sequel is that um the story ha must have has to have progressed a great deal the characters have to develop the situation has to be new but not but familiar but not repeated yeah. and so yeah. there and there's huge expectation of course especially after the film absolutely and, yeah it was a little bit daunting to be so audacious as to kill what other people thought happened in their own dreams and try and come out with something that was never going to deliver the first emotional impact in the way that the dressmaker did. Mm -hmm. You know, it was, it was never going to make that emotional love or hatred or whatever it is that people responded to. So it was a little bit dodgy. So it was, I, I finished it and I finished a couple of drafts. It was in very rough condition and to Tell, to find out whether or not it was going to work, if the idea was going to be all right and if it was going to be a sellable thing, if it was going to be a product, I just sent it off to the publishers um, and they wrote back and said, yes, it's good, it's, it's fine. And from that moment when you're given affirmation, when somebody, even if they tell you there's something wrong with it, at least they've read it and they've got through it and they've responded to it. So once I had the affirmation, then I just went with it and rewrote like a mad woman. And if your publisher had gone, this is not going to fly, this is not going to work, would you have been crushed by that assessment or would you have kind of taken it on the chin and gone, I'm prepared to go and do the work and do what I have to do? I would have been crushed initially. Um, I probably would have drunk too much wine <laughs> and then I would have been indignant it's and then I would have been defiant and thought, we'll blow you. I'm going to make it better because that's, I find that that's the way I respond. <laughs> but you trust implicitly the judgment of your editors and your publishers on this. They don't. They don't mess you around. I've lost your. I've lost your sound. Oh. It's okay. I've got you back. Okay. Yeah. No. I look. Um. I do trust my editors on this because they're the ones that they're a business. And they've got to sell the book. And they've they're got not to going to just book. suck up to you or pander to your vanity or whatever, are they? There, there's a little bit of, oh, I wonder if they're just saying that because of the dressmaker and they just want to sell it. But then yeah. but then when I got into the process with the editors, I understood that they were taking it quite seriously yeah. okay. and that they were involved in the story and they knew actually knew more about how the story was going to work and how it should be in this square thing with all these pages how it was going to read they know more about that than I do so it's a matter of coaxing me into a place where I can make it and then after a while you can see what they're doing and you go oh okay I'm with it and yeah. then you're kind of working in collaboration with you and then, it, then you yeah. feel like the entire yeah. universe is on your side so it's a lovely process. Rosalie, I'm, I'm going to do something very cruel to you. I'm going to say let's assume that your book is already out and let's assume that someone has decided to even make a film of it. Oh. 
Can you, can you, for our audience, can you say, could you describe the way the opening scene of the dressmaker's secret would 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 be how the film would open up? What would who would be in the scene, and what would we see, and and how would you establish that that beginning? Tragically, I don't think you would ever get Kate Winslet back again. No, um, you would have to offer her a huge amount of money to slip all the way out here. But given that we have done that and it is successful, um, you know, she's arrived and so has Hugo Weaving and Judy Davis and they're all back there again, although Judy Davis not necessarily. She's there in in, in flash, yeah. but not so much. Yeah. It would open, I imagine, in it's Collins. Justine. Yeah, it would open in Collins Street in 1953, and that's coronation. Coronation year, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And so there was a great deal of excitement uh, in some quarters of Melbourne. Apparently not all of Melbourne was, my research tells me that they weren't that fussed about the Queen getting crowned and they didn't care. But for the sake of fiction and for the sake of our movie, the fact that we've got Kate here and we need to do something special for her, it would be 1953. It would be the Paris end of Collins Street. Okay. Um, and there would be bunting and there would be Union Jacks and there would be shop girls wearing plastic tiaras and there would be, you know, advertisements for balls and there would be a great deal of excitement. And then the camera would move down the hill to the not quite so Paris end, just down to a towards Flinders Street, uh, Swanson Street a little bit. Yep, not yep. Far I know much. exactly where you are. Yeah. And we're across the road from the region kind of there. Is that where we are? There, we're exactly I there. Know the region. Across from the region. And not far from Flinders Lane, which was the yeah. Schmacher area. Yeah. Um, and then you would probably, in my mind, now you've got me very excited about this, and then the wow. camera would focus on the back of someone's head. Yeah. Whose head? Well, it would look like a boy because it would have short hair and dungarees. And when that person turned around, you would see that it's the beautiful and lovely Tilly Dunnage. Okay. And she would go into the shop and go upstairs to the atelier or the workshop and start making gowns. That would, that would be the opening scene. I thought when I, as I was rehearsing that question, it was about the only question I rehearsed, I, I, I had visions of you going, Bruno, that's a shocking thing to ask me. But you look like you relish actually doing that. I you know I've, I've got a bit. Do you fancy of... yourself as a kind of screenwriter, as a as a filmmaker? Do you do you, do you do you actually write in a filmic way? No, not in a filmic way. In a visual way, I tend to see see what's going on in in my head, and I try to describe it. Not, and I I have to admit that I've been a little bit influenced by the the film, and so yeah. this time this time I find myself having to go back and fill in and add description and add yeah. a little bit of introspection and a little bit of point of view from Tilly's mind and things like that. And the, the editors also picked up things like that because I was a little bit influenced by the whole screen thing. But I, but I was an extra on the film, so. I remember you said that, yeah. Yeah, and so I'm forever. I'm I don't remember seeing you. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm going to go and watch it again. I'm on the cutting room floor, I had a stupid grin on my face the whole time. It looked silly, so they cut me on on the. But I had a lovely time, and the thing about that was that I could see the the transformation, which is a the theme of the dressmaker and the dressmaker's secret. But I could see how that story was transformed for a screen. So I've kind of got a handle on it now, and it's a bit of a it's a bit of a sad thing. I've got a feeling I may. I should have possibly been a famous actress rather than, no, I'm joking. There's still I time. All the voice. And I could star in it with you. Yes. Ro Rosalie, yes. so, so, so we're, we're in this kind of salon mystique in Collins Street. The coronation is coming. Mm -hmm. There are balls happening all over Melbourne, according to the vibe we get in your book. Mm -hmm. There's the Moomba Queen thing. There's all of this. There, there, there's kind of designs coming from England and people are unmaking them and, and stealing the designs. Yes. Tell us about that world a little bit and, 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 and how that worked and 
and and what what was the go in terms of what people wanted to wear at that time? Oh, in my research, there was um, I came across a whole lot of evidence about people who do that. That people, of course, in the nineteen fifties, um, they would take photographs or do sketches, or if it was a pre-show before the premiere of a um, a collection, there were people that were hastily drawing pictures, um, and they were they were expelled and, their, and the picture that they drawn confiscated because then exactly. they would go away yeah. and have someone make that up and they would sell rip-offs on the street. And that went on quite a lot. But at Salon Mystique in Collins Street, um, Madame Flock goes to, the, uh, to Europe every year and buys up all the, either the rip-offs or what, what people tell her is couture but they're not really or she buys kind of almost couture or not quite and brings it back in huge steamer trunks and has her outworkers unpick it and turn it into um you know fashions that are sold in the boutiques out at Bulleen and places like that but they're done by those things are made by outworkers and the outworkers are supplied with the fabric to do it. And they, the outworkers actually, because they're so poorly paid, they skimp on um, the patterns and they make the seams smaller and the hems shorter and things like that so they can save a yard here or a metre there and they make their own and sell to their neighbours and so they make money. So there's this whole chain that comes from the couture houses in Europe and goes on a ship all the way to Australia or wherever else it's going to um, and is reproduced as knock-ups in, in all sorts of places. And they're not, they don't fit properly and they, they're, they're kind of mass-produced to fit everyone and they don't suit everyone. So it's a, it's a, bit, of a, it's a bit of a tragedy. Um, and, and Tilly, Tilly, who is an artiste, isn't she? She's not just a cutter. She she understands fabric. She can make fabric do things that the others in her workshop can't. Mm. How does she come to be there, and and what's her predicament at this at this stage of the story when we find her at Mrs. Flocks? Um, she's actually hiding in plain sight. Uh, it's it's an obvious place, yet it's not because it's a second rate salon but she needs to earn a living there are there she has very good reasons why she needs to make money and she needs to establish a home and she needs to set herself up for a future she wants to start again and erase everything or not erase but escape everything from her past yet she knows that they will find her eventually they will find her and so she spends her life looking over her shoulder wondering who it's going to be and um it's it's no secret because it's in the in the publicity but the first person to show up of course is sergeant ferret and he arrives and he wants a frock um and he can't he doesn't want to confront her and just show up so he devises a means by which she is forced to come down from her workshop above the salon and confront this somewhat awkward client who's ordered a dress that doesn't suit them. Um, and he demands, he says, I know you've got someone here who will, you know, make this dress look lo lovely on me. And Tilly knows that it's him and he knows that she knows that it's him. But she's in, put in a position where she has to go down and confront him. And this is where the story starts. And then the story kind of... Um, swaps between Melbourne and Dungatar okay. and Melbourne and Dungatar and it goes back and forth. Okay. Yeah. He he Sergeant Farat takes her to this place in um in South Yarra at one stage in the two chapters because I've only read the two chapters so I, I don't know about how it goes to Dungatar and that. Tell us about that world, the exoticness of that world because mm. in the Melbourne that I grew up in of course, this is the time that I grew up too. I had no sense of any of these kinds of places in Melbourne. It, it's an exotic place, isn't it? It's a, it's a place where people are artists and they discuss poetry and, and it's vibrant and it's out there and all of that, isn't it? They go there. Why do they go there? Um, well, they go for a drink and because Sergeant Ferret feels comfortable with Tilly and he wants her to see 
that there is a, another life that she could be part of. She could make costumes for these people because it was a it was a club called the Hippocampus Club, and it was a club for all. Did that really exist, or was this your name for it, or was this uh, you? It didn't, it didn't really. There was a there was a club much later on called the Seahorse Club. Okay. Um, and it's because seahorses, the males care for the children, and there's a bit of a gender. Yep you know, um, obscurity in all of that. So Sergeant Ferret's found his community and he's found his like-minded people and they're people from all work, walks of life and they live a very secret uh, life socially and they, and it's a very cultured life, as you mentioned. But they're always in fear of um, the repercussions because it wasn't until 1949 that homosexuality um, was no longer an offence that you could be hung for. Yeah. And anybody that was slightly different, unlike today, as we know, was branded homosexual. And if you were branded that, yeah. then you were, you know, set to be hung, drawn, quartered. It was a hugely terrible thing. So the people of the Hippocampus Club all, of course, um, live in fear that they will be found out. But that gets into the, the topic of, Wearing costumes sometimes makes you who you really are, whereas wearing couture turns you into someone that you are not. And that's one of the central ideas in in the story. And and the people who go to the Hippocampus Club come from all walks of life, the, a huge cross-section of um, life. And you're suggesting that in their out there in terms of what they're wearing, mm -hmm. that, that, that that is not a... a a hiding of something that is not trying to, but but they're actually finding a, an expression of their truer selves. Is that the kind of idea? Yeah, it is. And so that means that what they do in the day, what they wear to go to work or a yeah, judge or a lawyer or a doctor or surgeon or truck driver, whatever it is, the clothes that they wear for that, the costume, is actually the lie. painting them as you know, a lie to make them socially acceptable. Yep. So there's a question in there about what is socially acceptable. And again, as as in the in the dressmaker, what's acceptable and what's not acceptable and you know, it plays around with the, those ideas of disguise, um, and how disguise what what got you interested, the, interested in in that idea of of of, of, of how we can be most authentically ourselves and, and the yeah. whole role of, of of what we wear in that saga. I love wearing Indonesian shirts. Is that is that my little shtick about saying, look at me, I, I have part of my world in Indonesia? Is that a disguise? Is that a little bit of a frocking up so that I come out into the world in something that makes me feel a little bit kind of, I don't know, out there or whatever? Have you... Yeah. Is there some of that in all of us, do you think, yeah, mostly? Absolutely. I think so. And I think it's all of those things. But I wouldn't go so far as to say that um, in your case, wearing the shirts that you like is a disguise. I would say that they, everything else you said, they're a way of making you comfortable. They define you as who you are. They present to the world how you want to be seen, what you want other people to perceive of you. Or maybe they don't. Maybe you don't care. Maybe you dress for yourself. So all of those things are. Can we orchestrate that? Can we orchestrate the way we would like the world to see us? And yes. and 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 are our clothes one of the dominant ways of doing that? You think? And absolutely. Well, it's a visual thing. So when you, if you're going for a job interview, if you're going to the shop, well, not so much now because there's a pandemic, so everybody's in tracksuit pants, and sure. it doesn't really matter. No one cares. But under normal circumstances, you address according to how you need to be perceived. Um, or want to be perceived or to make an impression, to make an entrance, to blend in, uh, to make a statement, to give it to your mother-in-law or your father-in-law or whatever it is. You wear something that will say what you want to say that particular day or not. And everybody does it, but we're just not. It's so obvious that we just kind of don't, we don't consider it. And But most of the time we wear what, we feel like wearing, and but we don't acknowledge that behind what we feel like, uh, there's a whole complex from the moment you woke up, depending on the night's sleep that you got, what you had for breakfast, where you're going, what you're doing. That determines everything, but you're just not really conscious 
of it at all. Ludwig says, and, and he's he's having a, a big swipe at males and their suits and and the constrictedness of that garment, you know. He, and he says the distance from the person and their true selves is measured by the ties they have. And if you lay them kind of end to end, I, I was always taken by that, that idea of the, the suited people and those who play that game of, of the veneer being, you know, projecting of kind of strength and that is not really the reality, isn't it? We know that that's a big sham. Is your book a little bit about kind of discovering the sham too and, and discovering the vulnerability in kind of people beneath the kind of what they wear? Uh, more so for the people of Dungata. It's it's like it's quite uh, an obvious you know, um, I suppose trope, if you will, that the people of Dungata are wildly inadequate to the kind of clothes that yeah. they apply to, that they think if they wear those clothes, they will be better because they look yeah. better and they they feel better. But also that it's not just the people of Dungata. Tilly discovers that it's all people, no matter where she yeah, is. Yeah, that's and the it, impression I get, yeah. Yeah, and so when she confronts this, you know, well into the book um, and makes a decision about how she will use her talent because it's been weaponized in the past and it's been used yeah. for people's own selfish, um, evil intentions, even all the way down to the Baroque costumes that the, the people of Dungata are still wearing. Yeah. Um, she, ha she has a bit of a confrontation about what she's doing, what part she's playing in, you know, these people being able to exploit her and her talent. So she makes a decision. But it's, I, I love what you were saying about the suit because, you know, sometimes, you know, I watch chat shows from time to time and when the men or even women, they walk in in the garment and they spend a lot of time adjusting it, like yeah. the men have to adjust the trousers yeah. and the thing and they're always yeah. doing it. The women are always tugging at this skirt and I just go either raise the coffee table up so we cannot see their knees or, we, you know, it's a it's at waist length or tell them all to wear a large skirt yeah. or tracksuit pants just so that they can just focus on what they're going to talk about rather than me being distracted by the fact that they're wearing something that's yeah. annoying me. <laughs> I, I, I watch the ASEAN leaders at their big conferences and they've all got those most beautiful Bartik shirts on, and you know. And I think of everyone kind of being in suits and that and going, oh, that would just be hideous. Yeah. We, yeah. Take us back to Tilly. And she, she lives in Gertrude Street near the exhibition building. She's always imagining that there are people stalking her at that point. Yes. She's unhappy, isn't she, at that point? She what's is. what's what's the guts of her unhappiness? Um, her well, the tragedy of her past, the fact that even in escaping her past, she's still got the burden of she's still carrying it around. She thought she well, she didn't really think, but she might have resolved it by burning down the town, the town of Dungata. Sure. Um, but that turns out to be not the case. It just turns out that she's actually just created another past yeah. to flee from. And she comes to understand that. And because she has more things that she needs to hide, she's not at all happy. But through the book, um, you know, once she finds friends and a community and a family and you, you know, is is feels loved and gets what she wanted. She gradually, gradually starts to lighten up, and things start to get a bit terrific. But then, of course, tragedy does strike, but not as not not in the way that it did in the last in the first book. Um, but it's it's resolved a little bit more satisfactorily. I think this time, but you may not agree. I, <laughs> I, I, I can't add anything to that because no, that's don't. all a big unknown to me, isn't it? Mm -hmm. How important is Sergeant Ferrat in terms of Tilly finding her way to the life she yearns to lead? He's very he's instrumental. They make their they make their peace in very odd and very strange, yet entirely sensible way. Um, and the McSwineys arrive 
in her life again uh, as well. And Beulah and Marigold and a few of the <laughs> Gertrude, there's a few of them, but it's Sergeant Farrett that becomes her. Some of them in, are in an asylum at the at the opening part of your of your book, aren't they? Oh yeah, they're still there, Marigold and Beulah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but they get out. I, I'm still waiting to get out of mine. I'm interested in your book too as a piece of social history, Rosalie. I, I you know, just think, again in the couple of chapters that I had the good fortune to have smuggled towards me, you know, you've got. The Regent Theatre, Paper Boys, Hair and Pants, Bonbon Sleeves, mm. um, Espradils, The Q Lunatic Asylum, Pudding Bowl Hats, Dorothy L'Amour, Cheong Some Collars. Yeah. yeah. It was almost, I, I needed to almost go to a dictionary of fashion for nearly every second word of that. Did you have fun immersing yourself in, in, in that history and the, and the history of Couture at that time, and did you have to really learn it in in a very diligent kind of way, or or were you almost playful with it? I don't know, very playful with it. Uh, it's it's a fun thing to do. I mean, there's nothing quite so glorious as a book full of those gorgeous couture creations from the 1950s. I mean, they're just fabulous, you know. And so, in what way? What are they? What's fabulous about them? The 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 fabric, the texture, um, the the app, like the complete the fashion, the cut, the photography. Oh my gosh, Helmut Newton and Athel Smith and all those gorgeous photographs. Um, it it's just and it, and the glamour. Women were glamorous. Um, they were constrained and constricted in corsets, of course, the poor things. But, you know, you did never step out without your hat and gloves. And deportment and speech, um, accessories, all those things were very important. So it was an entirely different way of living. Um, and it was about presenting how you wanted to be seen and being respectable was being dressed in a certain way. Or It, it was just a lovely era. And... It, and um, it's I'm I'm old enough to be able to hold on to some of those memories. I was born in 1955, and so I have memories from my grandmother and my aunts and my mum, and you know conversations because you, you, you there's an awful lot of stuff that you're not conscious of that you have retained from your childhood. So I would find myself reading um, and looking at pictures, and then I would remember certain things and think, oh, I'll better put that in. And just you have to check them, of course. But, yeah. Rosalie, do you think in a subliminal way we, we are all interested in the world in which we are born into and that world in your book is the world that you and I were kind of born into, weren't we? Yes. Are we? Are we as not just writers but all of us always yearning to understand that and, and understand its secrets because it's the one world where we kind of do know that there were secrets and yeah well they were because it was the 1950s and the morals were fairly upright you know and so there there were secrets and people knew those secrets but nobody ever said anything about them because you would upset the equilibrium but I personally have an interest in my childhood and how it was in my childhood because I I see the childhood it's a natural thing as you get older you start thinking about life, the universe and everything and how it should be and you start comparing your idyllic, wonderful childhood, if it was, with what the kids are experiencing now. And sometimes I, I feel like saying to people, no, you've got it wrong. Yeah. But there's no point saying you've got it wrong because they have to grow through it and they yeah. have to come to terms with the whole thing. But it is fascinating to look back. And it's a nostalgic thing. It's a lovely mm -hmm. thing to rem remember back to your childhood and how things used to be. And that brings back your grandma and fishing and playing with the kids and in the neighbourhood and all those sorts of things. And the cars. I have such vivid memory of piling into cars in the 1950s with all the kids from the entire neighbourhood. There must have been 15 or 16 of us. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, just, and just being driven for miles and miles and miles, no seatbelts, no nothing, but 
in just in our bathers because we were kids and you could. Not if people that. born into this world of the 2020s, will they look back and feel their world is as, is as exotic as as the way you're portraying the world that you were born into? I think so. I think they will because I see also with interest the, the, the amount of affection and interest that my grandkids have for the things to create their world, that sure. establish their comfort zone, and they and they will look back on them in the same way, I'm sure. So yeah. if they read stories when they're 80 about what happened in 2020, I'm sure they'll be weeping with sentimentality, nostalgia. Rosalie, I'd just like to read a, a little bit of David Maloof to you. Yes. He says they, and he's talking about writers and novelists, and you're one of them. Uh -huh. They told you there was a life out there that was amazingly passionate. Nobody had ever told me that. If that's what was going on, it was a secret my parents and teachers had conspired <laughs> to keep quiet about. Yep. It's true, isn't it? Do you like that idea of yourself being the purveyor of an exotic kind of world and introducing people to an exoticness and a, and a passionateness that, that maybe in the world we grew up in we were kind of denied? Yeah, we were. We, we were to a certain extent. But, you know, when I was growing up, there was a ball every Saturday night. Right. Yep. So the Catholic ball or the footballer's ball or rotary or something. Yep. And uh, my mum would appear, she would spend all day with her hair in rollers and then she would emerge from her boudoir in the evening dressed in satin and diamonds and tiaras and fur and golden shoes and, of course, this, this is, I'm exaggerating, but there was that and, and I remember riding our push bikes when we shouldn't have around past the hall and looking in and seeing all the beautiful dresses and they were all Princess Elizabeth's. I all seem to be wearing the same dress, all twirling around inside. So there was, you know, there was that that was the, the spark of the imagination because when I was a kid, there were no, there wasn't really television or anything. And so we lived very much in our imaginations. We created all our own fun and all our stories. And then when the, when we did get television, it was, um, black and white films from Hollywood. Every lunchtime I would watch Bette Davis or Lana. Esther Williams or, yeah, doing yeah, the backstroke and stuff like so that. So there was, you know, it was just getting to the time where, you know, all those things were becoming more on the surface, yeah. uh, you know. And being a small country town person, small community person, you kind of knew there was a few secrets about the place and, you know. Absolutely. Rosalie, as a writer, is your imagine there? There are no boundaries, are there? In a sense, there are no limits to what a writer can do. Is that is that both a a kind of worrying freedom to have that to almost be lost in that, or is that an exhilarating freedom to go? I can create any world. I can go to any subject matter. I can I can investigate nearly any theme. Mm. Is that a liberating thing or a daunting thing? Oh, look, it's wonderful. And sometimes I do that and I write marvellous, marvellous things. And then I, you read them the next day and they're neither valid, sound or lucid and they're entirely unbelievable. <laughs> and so you just kind of go, well, no, if you've got to write a story that's going to be accessible and people are going to relate to, yeah. you're going to have to work a whole lot harder than that, Rosalie. You can't just write sure. that and expect people to believe it. You have to ground it in something that people can relate to and so uh, you know and also I don't kind of write those though that kind of book I don't think um the kind of books I write I could be entirely wrong I have no idea but they're not sort of fantastical or you know fantasy or they're just dark and nasty Rosalie when we were doing our little tech preparation for this um you were there in your in your kind of work room there in your studio and you know you looked very at ease in your own world and 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 um i think one of the librarians said bruno how do you pronounce your name and i went oh i'm bruno lettieri and then i said and you're rosalie and you said i had a a south american man whose motorcycle i rode on tell us about the freedom as a writer within your imagination compared to the exhilaration of 
of being out in an exotic world on the back of a motorcycle? Are they comparable or are they vastly different? And do you still yearn to be on the back of a motorcycle sometimes? Oh, yeah. And it's not so much the motorcycle because it was damned uncomfortable and I've still got sciatica. (laughs) It was the feeling and it was the lack of responsibility. It was the lack of baggage. It was the, the, the freedom to be able to do what I wanted, when I wanted, how I wanted, with no supervision or no one saying you shouldn't be doing this I kind of felt grown up and 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 very very daring and I honestly think that if you're going to get yourself into a kind of the sort of state of mind to write something that you that's the state of mind you need to be in and that is why writers will go away for a week or three weeks or whatever it is because there's a certain point in the process where you need to be you've got the structure and you've got the story and the people come in that door and go out that one and that happens and he does that and all that kind of stuff but there's the other bit um that is making like infusing it with the kind of emotion and the nuances where which is where the empathy with the reader um is embedded so right or I do anyway I need to go away and spend a week or so and get into this sort of emotional oneness with my great work um and you you kind of it's hard to explain and you don't want to sound pretentious in any way but I think most of us us writers need to tap into that, that that feeling of like I remember being at the top of the Rockies and the mo- we were up so high that that my boyfriend at the time's motorcycle kept cutting out because it wasn't getting enough fuel. And I just remember standing, and I I could have made this up, but I just remember because we rode through Death Valley, and you know that whole you know that thing in all the westerns where they've got all those great stalactites. Well, anyway, we rode through that, and I remember standing there and looking at that and feeling the endless possibility what awaited me when we finally got to the other side because we started on the west coast and we're riding across to the to the east coast and then we went down to South America but we didn't take the the bike and so all of that was was before me and um the world was mine I could have done anything I wanted and Rosalie if that had have happened hadn't have happened would 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 there be something lacking in terms of you being able to do what you do now? Was that a necessary precursor no, to wonder the world in that way? I don't think it is because I, I can see people. There's people there. I don't think it is, but I think that people. Um, that's distracted me. That's little, okay. That's the thing, but I'll come back to me. So yeah, no, I think that. Um, if you're going to be a writer, you will be a writer because there's only so much of that that you require, that freedom and that liberation and all that kind of stuff. There's only so much of that you, that you really but, but, require. But the going out and seeing the world first, I'm, no, I'm no, suggesting. You've got to do that. No, no. You have to. You yeah. have to do that. You've got to go out and find out, um, you know, explore. And see, and I'm feeling at the moment, and everybody is, I know they are, but I'm feeling like I've got nothing going in. Yeah. I, I'm just so confined and nothing is going on in my brain and I need to go forth into the world and encounter people. And I find myself dreaming about that, of, of, of lying in bed, thinking where can I go and imagining all these things I'm going to do because I've planned Christmas and beyond and I've done all of that and then, the, then there was nothing. So then I started dreaming about where I will go and what I will do and who I will meet. And is there a book in Brunswick coming out at any stage? about Brunswick and the people in your street? No. No? No. No. I think I think I'll probably the next one I will I will travel Europe overseas. I think that I'll I'll do that. Brazil or somewhere like that. And and, and do it as a travel book, I'm suggesting. Yeah, no, I think I yeah. probably would. Now that you've mentioned it, um I've there's, there's certain things that that you accumulate along the way in, in life that you can use and you could put it into yep. a story yep. like that. So I just I just might do that one day. You never know. Are you a happy woman, Rosalie? Yeah, no reason yeah. not to be. Um, I try to be as happy as I can be. What about you? Are you happy? I, I'm deliriously happy. I'm very lucky. 
I get to work with people like you. I, I get to wear batik shirts. I get to live in two worlds. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I'm very lucky. It's been a joy talking to you again, Rosalie Ham. Yes. Thank you, Bruno. Let's make a secret. It's going to be out soon, isn't it? Yeah. And yeah. how do people... How do people buy it in advance? What do they do? Oh, I think there might be something on the Wyndham Library website, but you okay. can you can pre pre order it, and it's out on the twenty seventh of October. But you can pre order oh, and get. We've, we, we've jumped the gun. I feel so deliciously naughty having jumped the gun and been able to do this first and the thank first you. chat. Thank you so much, Rosalie Ham. Thank you. It's thank been you. a pleasure. Thank yeah. you. Thank you thank to all you. the people at Wyndham. Yes, and thank you all the people. Our wonderful yes. audience out in the West. I know you're doing it hard, but it's been a joy putting this on for you. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you so much, Bruno and Rosalie, for an absolutely illuminating discussion. Thank uh, you. And to, to everyone at home as well. Um, the link to pre order uh, The Dressmaker's Secret has been posted in the meeting chat. Fantastic. Um, and the recording for this session will be up on the library website and YouTube channel sometime uh, next week. So if you missed anything and want to go back, um, keep an eye out for that one. Thank you so much again and have a lovely evening, everyone. Thanks. I am going to end this meeting and Thanks, you will Percy. all disappear. Thanks. Have Thanks, a nice Rosie. night. Thanks, Micah, in Thank the background. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.